Hi, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome. Thanks for coming through to the launch of a rather special uh, book by Jeff Olifier. Runs gently upon the earth is a, a labor of love that's been coming together over the last while. And uh, we're going to open with a few words from Dylan Lewis, who's very kindly allowed us to use his uh, spot here today. So Dylan, without further ado, over to you. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually an honor to have uh, Jeff's book launch here, in that we go back a long, long way. Uh, Jeff was my art teacher at school, um, so well, may well have had something to do with where I am today. Um, I certainly I did better in my school career than my um, tertiary education because I failed tertiary art in Cape Technicon. Um, but yeah, in, in time picked it up again and it's become obviously for me a central focus of my life and work and thinking. Uh, but also the, the concept of the Bushman, there's a tie in there for me as well in that you know, I've spent a lot of time wandering in Africa's wild spaces and the Bushmen are ever present in terms of both literally in, in their paintings and works in remote areas, but also uh, in spirit in terms of the land that they once inhabited. So, you know, for me, Jeff's book, talking about that has been really interesting and also understanding something of the history which is a history that I didn't know, particularly in terms of the first contact with European races. Um, um, I needed to do some brushing up on that, which I appreciate, Jeff, as your, your historian's uh, abilities. That comes through strongly in the book as well. So it's a yeah, privilege to have you here. I was going to say a few words about Jeff, but just uh, having a look around, I think that that would be a, you know, I'll just be telling you stuff you already know, so we won't go there. But a good place to start would be to just discuss Jeff's book um, and uh, what kicked it all off was a discussion, I believe, with Paul Kilimia at school. Yeah. Would you like to, yeah. to take over, Jeff, and just tell us a bit of the background of how you ended up with this? Yeah, some people, a couple of people have heard this already, and hard luck. Um, <laughs> when, preschool, so I was sort of maybe five. Um, I remember my maternal grandparents had a friend who used to appear and disappear randomly and I never found out how it worked, or if it worked, or if it was just random, but she was sad, and she used to come for a weekend, or a week, or two weeks, or three weeks, and then vanish again, and then reappear. And um, I was always intrigued by her, um, incredibly wise person. Um, I never found out, and now there's no one I can ask, how we were connected, um, my family and her. Um, and then up in um, the uh, Victoria West District where I've got lots of family and my one cousin Johan who farms there is here. Um, there are still remnants of the original um, San the Bushman who lived in that area though, on those farms. Um, some of it is etching, some of it is painting, some of it are, are rocks that they used as um, instruments, implements. Um, there are some people who are still um, direct uh, descendants of the San in that region. And on, on Quikwa, the farm where we always went, um, which was a sort of the central family farm, if one can call it that. Um, it's been in the family since 1854. There are still people there who have um, a connection with the original uh, groups who stayed there, who lived there uh, in their natural state, let's say. And it was always something that, that intrigued me. So it was an intrigue all the way. And then um, when I was in grade 10, 11, and 12, we had to read 
in those days you had to read a number of books and you had to be able to talk on any of them. And I ended up having like nearly a hundred books on my list uh, because I just enjoyed reading and I read quite fast. And I thought, oh, I can write, I can write a book. And then when I was at university, my first year at university, I wrote a book and it was rubbish. But I then realized how difficult it is to write a book. Um, and I'm, sadly, it got lost in one of the, the moves that my parents made in Gordon's Bay. But it's here, so I could sort of pull it out and rewrite it with a lot more experience in writing now. But the, the book, this book, uh, runs gently upon the earth. So in 1995, towards the end of the year, I was sitting in the staff room at Sachs chatting to uh, Paul Gilliamir, who's the head of Afrikaans. And I was teaching a, a first language Afrikaans class at that stage. And um, we were talking about books because I'd chosen a specific book as one of their, their literature books, which was uh, quite interesting, different, and nobody else was prepared to actually use that book. And I said, no, I want this book. I want to use this book with my class, even if only my class has it, which we were allowed to do. Because in, in when you write your matric, those of you who remember, you can actually select the questions from whichever books you studied as a matric because the schools didn't necessarily study exactly the same books. Except in my day, you had to do Shakespeare. And it had to be in, in each year, it had to be that one or that one. That changed. Anyway, so we were talking about this, and then I just mentioned to Paul that I'd written this, this book that I wasn't very happy with. And I had this idea in my head about this book. And he said to me, Meneer, an Elke and Van Ons is our book you wrote it net scrape. In every one of us, there's a book, you must just write it. So I took that to heart and I started the research in towards the end of 1995. And what I did have was a historical timeline. I knew the history, most of it. I had to do some research for it. But I had a timeline of what I was going to follow. But how I was going to follow that, I had no idea whatsoever. And in fact, I said it last time as well, I still don't know where it all came from. So I created these cards with the historic timeline on it and people and dates, etc. And then I started to put that together. And I started writing on the 20th. dropping here playing Wilbur Smith because I taught his son. Um, I had spoken to him about um, what happens when you get to a point where you sort of get a, a, a mental block and you can't can't write that that day. What happens? Mm -hmm. So he said, well you from from his experience he said you write and you know that you're writing nonsense. So you stop and you get up and you go and you don't come back till the next day. And then you go again. And you remove whatever you wrote then because it's not good anyway. So if you get writer's block, that's what you must do. Well, I'm blessed, lucky, I never had it once. I wrote every day and I just wrote. And this, this story just emerged. It's totally, to me still, it's totally surreal. But it did. And the, the more I had researched, the more I sort of understood on the one hand, but also absorbed what these people have gone through and where they are now. And with all due respect to whoever, they are nowhere now. They are still nowhere. And uh, Andy reminded me on the way here, he was um, staying at a, a b, b on a farm and the people there have been trying so hard to get some sort of identity just for the people that are with them on the farm. And they, they are what you'll remember, some of you might know, as Karakis Mensa. They were the guys that used to go around in a donkey cart and they used to shear the sheep at different farms. Because some farmers sheared um, every year and some farmers sheared every eight months. It, it depended on who you were, how you were, what your sheep were, etc. Johan knows all about that. He's a, 
a, a sheep farmer, amongst other many things. And those people don't have any identity. They don't have ID cards. They don't have anything. They don't have a driver's license. They don't have um, a bank card. They have nothing. They are non-people in terms of this government. And with all due respect, the previous government as well, so before 1994, they also had no identity. And the, the, biggest, the biggest problem, I've just finished reading a book called um, Bushman Stories by a guy who wrote in the late, you know, late 1800s, 1860s onwards. And he, he sort of, I don't know, put that, that whole concept of them having no identity together. Because, number one, they don't have any kind of what you would call a political system. It doesn't exist. They don't have leadership. They don't have a captain or a, a chief or a paramount or anything at, at all. They, they function um, sort of as elders who have more experience and youngsters have more energy. And the women and the men, okay, the women, the, the, men, the, the women are to a large extent the, the gatherers and the, the men to a large extent are the hunters. But other than that, they do everything together. So this government say they can't negotiate with them. Well, from my perspective, you can't negotiate with them anyway. It's not your right to negotiate with them. We, we occupied their land. This is theirs. And if we can acknowledge that, it doesn't mean you lose anything. Just acknowledge that. And allow these people a space in, in our world. Because they don't have one. And of course, inevitably, and you'll, you'll, I'm going to read one short piece that brings this out. Um, you have, as happened in, like, for instance, the, the USA, Canada, <clears throat> to a certain extent, some of the Central and South American states, you have people turning to alcoholism. They turn to drink to cover a number of things, to, to cover their pain, to cover their lack of... The, the, the fact that their dignity has been removed and and so you have that complication and huge problem actually uh, which still exists um, and in some cases getting worse but I don't want to go too much into that I'll read a, a short piece which indicates that so it, it starts in 500 BC and goes all the way through to 2004 as it goes from the first people that arrived here from East Africa, and then the people who arrived here from Central and West Africa, and then the Portuguese, and then the Dutch, and then the English, and to a, to a small degree, the, the French Huguenots. Um, it's all in there. And then it, it sort of changes gears from the middle of the 1800s to these unfortunate people having to try and find a way themselves to do things, to to advance maybe, but to get somewhere. I know that's a bit open-ended, but in the book, it, it gradually goes into the early 1900s where you um, have the first um, San kids going to schools and then going to university and then getting into the legal profession and trying every single avenue possible to get themselves recognized. So if you, if you know anything about today, South African history, if you have a look at the South African crest, they are acknowledged on the crest. They are these figures on the crest. But that's it. And they're slowly but surely being allowed, number one, to die out, and number two, their language to disappear. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, we should be teaching that at schools because they should be recognized. So Jeff, I think that's something that you're touching on there, that's, you know, you taught art and, and history at school. And what I found so amazing about reading your book was the way that you've incorporated a, a storyline through historical fact. You've, you've uh, brought the whole uh, 
first people's world alive from 500 BC to virtually the present. And you've done an amazing job of that. Um, and one of the things that I know, um, there are those that say, you know, who are you to write this book? And uh, what I really appreciated about reading the book is that you've written it in a way that is non-judgmental. You just stated the facts, and it's for the reader himself, herself, to decide, you know, how they feel about that. Um, and uh, it's 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 important that you've done it that way because then people can't, uh, you know, question your your ability to write the book. Uh, you know, is it your your right, as it were? Um, but yeah, it's it's an incredible work that spans two and a half thousand years. And uh, we were just chatting about it the other day, and Jeff was saying it, it was easy to write. I mean, I still can't get my head around it being easy to write a, a work that spans that length of time and, and the geography of it. But yes, what Jeff alluded to, I, I was on a farm in the Karoo the other day, and that they were seriously trying to enable the children to get places in schools, which was impossible without the parents having IDs, birth certificates, all of those good things. And that is a, a legacy of, of what Jeff was talking about, how these folk have been forced uh, you know, out of the mainstream, as it were. And now you've got these <coughs> folk in today's world that just are battling to get their kids into a school. And, and I'm afraid you guys are going to be scarred for life when you've read the book. <laughs> because just the other day I was driving back from Neisner through the Kochmans Kloof and I, I, you know, I was lost in Jeff's book because there's a beautiful scene where Pachiro's busy doing his painting in that Kloof on an overhanging rock. And, I was kind of trying to figure out which rock he was he was working on as I drove through there. But it's it's uh, it's one of those things that he brings to life in a, a vivid manner, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So, at the end of you know proceedings, please come up to the the front and let Jeff sign a book for you. Uh, I've, I've, well, I have chosen. It wasn't me. It was <clears throat> my esteemed editor, and I'll do the thank yous just now, John, who suggested these um, different readings to the ones I did the other day. Um, so something that, that occurs a couple of times, especially in the first part of the book, are hunting, how they hunted, and how this was done, and how the boys became um, hunters. And the, I'm going to read that one um, first. On the third day, having passed by two herds of cattle and Avoiding contact with the Khoi herders, the hunting group came to a vast plain studded with acacia and hook-thorn trees and an occasional mound of rocks standing proud of the flat plain. There were springbok, ostriches and small herds of zebra and wildebeest scattered across the plain. Latui was positive that this was where they would find the Yelat. The group had not seen any cattle for a while so they were all sure that there would be game here to hunt. A few hours into the day, Tatui slowed as Giam put up his hand and crouched down. All the men followed suit and sat still. Looking out ahead to where Giam pointed far in the distance, standing below a large group of thorn trees, Giam saw the familiar silhouette of the mighty Yelan bull. And in the shade nearby stood a small herd of eight of the mighty antelope. Yelan stood with their heads up as they chewed on the cut after a morning of grazing the lush grass. This would not be an easy hunt, as the animals could see just as far as the people. Taking his bearings from two distinctive rocky mounds, Giam led the group crouched down below the top of the grass as surreptitiously as they were able. Only now Tui would raise his head up slightly, holding a pair of spring up horns on his head as camouflage and scout their position to be sure that they were on course to reach the Elan herd. He noticed that there was there were a very large bull and two younger bulls and five cows. Uh, Tui now directed Gyan to move downwind so that they would not allow their body odor and sounds, which could unnerve 
the antelope. The other men trailed away behind so as to give the boy the best chance of success. Giam moved quickly towards the closest rock mound, followed at a short distance by a tantui, and he took a dried branch of an acacia and held it just above his head to break his profile enough so as not to startle the animal. He carefully climbed the rock mound and scouted the territory ahead. Giam descended down the far side of the mound and slowly crept closer. His mentor, Atui, let him go ahead on his own and Giam eventually got to within shooting range and quickly released an arrow. Giam watched as the little arrow found its target and looked with apprehension to see if the arrow stayed home. The young bull moved his head only slightly but did not move away, thus giving Giam a chance to fire a second arrow which also flew true. Giam watched as the bull reacted, shook its head briefly from side to side and headed for a close by tree to rub away the sting. This new pain unsettled the young bull a bit and he started to move off away from the trees out onto the plain in a slow ambling trot. Giam watched carefully to see how the bull would react further but the antelope merely moved on slowly. It was easy for him to swallow at a jog, once again remaining low and at a distance so as not to startle the animal anymore. They knew that this would be a long time of tracking as they were, large, they were large animals and the poison would take many hours to slow them to a standstill. Giam kept his eyes on the bull he had hit and Tautui followed him, making sure that his charge remained patient. The other men had caught up with the hunters and they tracked the eland by eyesight while they remained stationary. Giam was a good runner, just like his father, very swift and had rare stamina. He easily kept up at this relative slow pace and followed the animals all day into the dusk before they eventually slowed down and then settled in the shade and near some trees. The antelope seemed set in for the night, so the men and Giam also settled down a distance away and lit a small fire to cook. It was evident that the young bull was already under stress and it still rubbed itself against a nearby tree, breathing heavily. The group took turns all through the moonlit night to keep an eye on the herd in case they moved off before sunrise. The excitement in Giam did not allow him to sleep. He listened to the hyenas and jackals and he watched all around, peering into the moonlit felt for predators and scavengers. It was quiet and peaceful with only a light breeze blowing toward them. The following morning it was evident that the younger bull had given in to the poison. He stood, legs splayed, panting shallowly, and drooling from both his nose and mouth. Giam now had the task of dispatching this bull. He stalked warily and silently up to the prone animal, which snubbed at his presence. Even when the cows moved off, paralysis was claiming its victory. Giam went right up to his stricken bull, looked it in the eye, gave reverence to the great animal, and felt a moment of grief for what he had done to this majestic antelope. He quickly slipped the spear between the ribs to end its life. The animal swung and gently went down on its knees and rolled onto its side, taking its last long breath. Giam knelt down and placed a hand on the animal's forehead and stayed kneeling until the rest of the men arrived, in honor of being allowed to take the lives of these great animals to become hunters and men. So that is a good example of uh, how Jeff has been able to time travel back through the ages to, uh, I mean, how amazing was that description of the hunt right there? Uh, and I was blown away by the, the attention to detail, although knowing Jeff, I shouldn't have been. Uh, because he, whatever he tackles is done in a meticulous, workmanlike manner, and he, this this novel is no different. Um, but I, I, what I really appreciated was the level of education that I accidentally got about their way of life, and the tools that they used, the weapons that they used, and yeah, I, that's what I found particularly um, interesting was how, uh, as I said a moment ago, the story and the history were, were intertwined. Um, it, it's, uh, it's quite
quite amazing. Do you want to read the next one while you have the book in hand? Yeah. So this one is what I spoke of earlier, is about the painting. Um, and there are so many um, Bushman or sand paintings. Just to, uh, to remind people, the term sand, well, let's go back. The term Bushman is derogatory. We use it because it's convenient. The term sand is convenient because we're not talking about a nation. We're talking about the first people. They're not a nation. They are numbers of groups of people with slightly different um, ways of, of speaking. They have, we know that they use a, a variety of tricks. Um, we know that the northernmost um, sand can speak to the southernmost sand. Their, their dialects are not identical, but they are close enough to be able to communicate with each other if they need to. But they are not a nation. There's no word in their terms that indicates that they are a people, because they're not. Not in, not in our sense, they're not. So, you know, you can say, all oh, right, the ANC said they can't negotiate with them. They can't. They're not a nation. They are people. And I think one must just remember that. So I was at quite two a while ago, and Andy and I going there on Sunday again. <clears throat> and I asked the, um, the director there, Michael, plus two of the SAN um, who work there, and I said, I need, I need to just cover this. So Bushman's derogatory. And I said, I'm now being told that sand is derogatory mm -hmm. and that I must call the people the queer, K-H-W-E. And then all three immediately said, no, the queer are from Northwestern Botswana. They are a single dialect of all the groups. You, you use the word sand because that's the one that we use to indicate all of those people. And he, he said nobody, or they said nobody's going to uh, say anything about you using that and saying it's derogatory because it's not. But it's, it's our way of indicating those people, not their way of indicating who they are. For them, it's a language group and it's a clan. And they have no inter-identity. They are people that have been there for hundreds of thousands of years. And I, I think one must just keep that in mind. And then, of course, they've left their, their identity in their painting. And it's interesting that so many of these paintings still exist, and some of them through terrible uh, weather, and, you know, Dusty sitting on the rocks above and weeing down on it, and it's still there in many cases. Unfortunately, lots of people have decided that they want to have good photographs of it, so they chuck water on it, or they use um, flash, photography and they are destroying it and some of them basically chop the rocks out and take carry it out. So this is just a little bit about um, painting. Once he had recorded, oh, just before I go, they didn't paint a scene. They painted a memory of the scene. So they weren't copying something. They were painting how it actually affected them to see whatever they were painting, animal, human, uh, countryside, water, whatever it might be. So when they painted, they had to um, almost go into a trance to do the paintings because it was a memory that they were painting. Once he had recorded the journey from the Great River to the mouth of the Olifant River, he also painted the encounter with the beach people. Uh, the beach people in the derogatory sense are the Strandlupers, the beach walkers. He also painted the encounter with the beach people, but still could not attempt to imagine what the great white birds could look like. The great white birds that he was referring to were the um, sailing ships that went by. So initially the Portuguese. So the caravels that uh, people like uh, Das and Columbus and people like that used. And if anyone thinks they're big ships, they're not. They're, they're about from here to the counter line.
and imagine traveling around the world on one of those, or across the Atlantic or wherever, around Cape Point when the southeast is blowing. Uh, he made white paint by burning oyster shells that the beach people would always lay upon the same midden and use the white powder to ground. He ground from the burnt shells as well as some limestone that he found on the journey. Ian Seca and another youth, Simanqua, set out one morning to find materials to make the paint. These boys showed promise as potential artists. They both often drew in the white sand with sticks while observing the wildlife. Why I say white sand is because they were on the beach of the west coast near the Olifants River mouth at this stage. Makame was also too, was all too happy to answer all their questions about his paintings and his occasional etchings on flat black ironstone rocks. Kamege sometimes took them to other smaller rock faces to teach them how to sketch e events on rocks. He taught them how to draw and paint people of various kinds, all the common animals and birds. The way of teaching of the Gamahava, the greater god, and the Gama, the lesser god, and the use of the perception of the animal, not the cerebral memory. He needed to teach them of the recalling of the essence, the life body of the people and animals. Each sand artist had to learn in their own way how to render his observations, which he held in his heart, and find their own inspiration to create a story or their recollection of events. He needed to teach them about the soul body of the animals, about the feeling you attach to renderings if you want soft rain or heavy rain, and if he uses a small amount of water in the powder to make the paint, then he can lure the rain as a selfless act, an act of almost unconscious will of the soul. Hirekoa kuhusu uman, which in English is, I want the rain, but it is an almost unconscious plea. The boys had to learn, but for them, it was not a trial. It was simply a journey that they took with their teacher. So, I don't know how many of you have seen first-hand uh, Bushman paintings, sand paintings. Uh, they are quite incredible. Um, in some of them, the detail, especially in the etchings, the detail is absolutely unbelievable. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but on one of my cousin's farms up in the Kopi, um, my uncle at that stage um, found some etchings and in fact only the cousin that lives on the farm, myself and the professor of um, anthropology at um, UCT now, today, know where it is. And those drawings are unbelievable. They are so beautiful and so real and absolutely proportionate. And it's interesting that they drew them on the south side of the rocks so that the sun wouldn't ultimately over the generations destroy them. But they are amazing. And their, their paintings are slightly different to their uh, etchings. Um, as I said, the paintings are more about a memory um, or a soul memory, um, not an image of what they were looking at. So yeah, that's a little bit about the painting. There's, there, there are other places that Andy mentioned in um, near Montague, where in the book they were painting there as well. But there are quite a few spots in the book where, where different kinds of painting, different places, where they left their, their uh, memories and their images. What is quite amazing about your uh, telling us about these artists is how you get into the detail of the kit that they had the paraphernalia that they carried with them, how they stored their pigments, how they made those pigments. You know, um, here we've got the, the historian once again uh, putting his research together in a, in a way that doesn't feel like you're reading an historical uh, narrative. It's more a story that accidentally uh, teaches you how they did things. Um, and I'm sure you, you're getting the sense of how vividly Jeff brings the life of the, the first people to life again after all this time. And, uh, 
and in that first reading, I was struck once again by the respect that they had for Mother Earth and that they took only what they needed and left behind for the next crowd that were coming through. There wasn't this uh, kind of greed that the modern conglomerate seemed to have. You know, they, they, they respected the earth and, and that comes through quite strongly throughout the, the book. Uh, and I know that's something that's close to your heart as well, is uh, planting trees and, and, and the like. Um, and vegetables. <laughs> and vegetables. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, for, for me, I think that's something that the, the global conglomerates can learn from, and uh, just about having a little bit more respect uh, for the earth. Um, yeah, I think um, the the next reading yeah. drags us kicking and screaming from those times through to a far more century. modern twentieth century. Uh, setting where the, the the impact of the various arrivals is well and truly being felt by the sun and uh, so yeah the, the next reading is uh, is in a, a 20th century context yeah um, I think that this this sort of draws from in the 1800s when the first people were exposed to alcohol and it eventually became a policy to expose them to alcohol was it a way it was a way of subduing them or taking away their identity and so I've, I've gone on into the 20th century now and how just one small element of this emerged in this uh, story, um, how drinking has impacted and affected these people, and also, you know, as you as you go through the book and you come towards the, into the twentieth century and into the twenty first century, you will see how their names change from being sand names or ikun names to being. Um, Afrikaans or Dutch names to being French names to being Afrikaans names to being something acquainted, acquainted to English names. Janus' drinking that night forced Marty his wife to drive to Louisfontaine the following day. They set off in the morning with two children in front of the bench seat and Janus lying in the back sleeping off the previous night's overindulgence. Marty drove silently, nursing her disappointment in him. Halfway to Louis Fontaine, she stopped the car, told Janice to get out. She threw a bottle of water over his head and told him to pull himself together. He did not even argue. Simply opened his suitcase, took out a fresh shirt, dried his hair and face, and sat in the front passenger seat with the two children happily in the back. Marty drove on again in silence. At Louis Fontaine, Marty stopped the car just short of the town. She was infuriated. Are you going to behave yourself now and stop drinking? In my parents' home, not a drop will pass your lips. Do you hear? What will it look like when we give them our news and you look drunk? You are thin enough that they will ask why. I'm sorry, Marty. I want to stop drinking. The burden lies too great upon me. I will try. I know it makes no sense that I fight against the liquor stores that provide cheap liquor to our people, but I drink so much myself. Just help me, please. I love you so much. Well, you'll have to, t to manage. We are not going to have a child and you'll have to help me. I can't and won't do it alone while you siphon away our happiness. Now straighten yourself up. You hear me? James was silent. Another stark reminder of how uh, the first people have been well and truly impacted by the arrivals along the way. And I, I, that it was actually policy is, is unbelievable. 
I know on the wine farms, the dorp system was a thing for, for many boons. Um, but yeah, when you read a little snippet like that of the impact on a, a single family, you can only begin to imagine the extent of it across uh, the entire region. Um, but uh, I think what Jeff's three readings have done is they've given you guys a, a small little uh, view of what you're in for when you when you've got your own copy signed by the author himself. And uh, I envy you because you're going to go on a, a wonderful journey as you as you read through the book. Um, it's 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 definitely worth doing and uh, it, it's a it, in some pl places it's a complete page turner you just can't put it down um, but I, I think without further ado Jeff uh, you've got a few people you yeah. wanted to thank yeah so <clears throat> firstly of course um, I want to thank Dylan As he said, we've come a long way. And for Dylan to, to um, offer um, for me to have this gathering and, and um, do a, a launch in this um, part of the, of, the, of the Cape is, is such a privilege. So Dylan and Gabby and Susanna and all your staff, thank you so much. And then, of course, Andy for uh, emceeing both uh, launches. Andy and I come away also from the 1980s. Um, his mom actually replaced me as the art teacher at Saxe when I changed to history. So thank you again. And your words about the book. <clears throat> the eats are provided by another Sax connection, Jenny McColgan. She does this as a living. Um, and then to, I actually don't know his name, but to the barista at the back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and then, you know, as Andy mentioned, I did too, just to thank Paul Killamy in, in absentia for um, encouraging me in a way to write this book and for Wilbur Smith to tell me how to deal with um, writer's block. Um, and then my amazing editor, John. Now, w we came together by accident. <clears throat> um, one of the boys that I was teaching history, I think he was in grade 11 at the time, I'm not sure. His mom was a maths teacher at Sachs. She wrote the, the first or the new um, maths textbooks for the answer series. And um, this is, this is the story anyway, this is what I heard, that um, David went with his mom to a dinner with the, the um, owners of this publishing company because his dad was away in Dubai on business, so David went. And of course, um, his mom and, um, and Edie were talking about the textbooks and how they wanted to expand it into other subjects as well. And David apparently immediately said, oh, I know who will write the history book. And of course, apparently, Anne looked at him like, oh. And he said, yeah, Mr. O will write it, don't worry. And that's how I came to write the grade 10, 11, and 12 new history books. I had been involved with um, the department, the National Department of Education, on, on sort of rejigging the actual um, syllabus for grade 10, 11, and 12. So I had that in my head anyway. So I went to um, where the, the publishing took place and met John. And John and I headed off right from the beginning and still do. And I'm so thankful for that. And she was amazing in, in creating this book because I just wrote it. So I just had this raw, rough manuscript and Jean taught me about the high hanging fruit and the low hanging fruit and how to um, put the, the chapters together and you don't need that, you do need this, you've got to do that. 
how about this? And then when you get to the last chapter, she said, you can't have this chapter. <laughs> so I said, no, it, this is the last chapter. This is what it's going to be. And she said, the whole book from beginning to end is historically accurate, but not the last chapter. So I said, well, I, the last chapter has to be that. I said, it is a novel. Um, because if one event had happened, one part of one event had happened, that last chapter would have been real. And I know that because I was part of the, the decision that was made at that point. So when you read it, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, when you read it, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. And for me, it had to be that. That had to be the end of this particular book. And I'm not writing a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to um, thank uh, Yanni and, and Bimpi Ulifir at Kwekwa, where I stayed for the beginning part uh, and one little part in between um, to write the book. Um, Kwekwa is the, the sort of old family farm and then next door, which has become part of it, is Witkrans, where I stayed and wrote. And it was brilliant because I was in the Sornkammer in the sun room and I could see like for 42 kilometers to the next range of mountains and there was one tree and it was just beautiful. I love that starkness that I was able to be part of. So, Yanni and Bimpi, Olifir at Kwekwa, then um, I have to thank them. And then, sadly, uh, Professor Jonathan Janssen, he works too much, just to give you an idea of what sort of a person he is. So in the mornings, he, he's at Stellenbosch University, he's a professor of, of education there. In the mornings, he goes to schools all over the peninsula. And not only disadvantaged schools, some other schools as well, um, advantaged schools or different schools. And I went to his uh, book launch on Tuesday last week, and he said that he was at Cedar House, because Cedar House have um, students that don't really fit into the, the bigger schools. They, they have, I hate to use learning disabilities, they, they learn differently. And Cedar House accommodates that. So he went there and he did a grade nine in the physics class. And as usual, when he teaches, he's jumping, he's jumping around and walking around and writing things on the whiteboard or he's got a video on, or he's doing something. He just never stops. He's got amazing energy. And eventually one of the little boys, little 14 year old, in the front put up his hand. So the professor asked him to, you know, what question have you got? So he said to him, are you ADHD? <laughs> <laughs> he is. He is ADHD. And he's sitting uh, out of the mouth of babes. But, um, so he does that in the mornings. He, he tries to help uh, schools, be they, you know, big um, posh schools or schools in uh, the Cape Flats or in the townships or special schools, if you want to call them that. Um, schools for alternate learning, like Cedar House, for example. He does that in the mornings, um, virtually every morning. And then he does his, his lectures and his mentoring, etc., at the university in the afternoons. So he, he works hell of a hard. And in fact, how I got to get or, or ask Professor Janssen to write the uh, forward, um, I went to exclusive books in um, Cavendish, and I bought a book by Andrew Smith called Koi Sun. Now, he wrote the book Koi Sun because there's no such thing as Koi Sun. You either Koi or you're, or you're San. Koi is, is, in the old terms, Hottentot, and San is Bushman. So they're not even the same. They're not even um, genetically the same. They don't even come from the same part of the world. But he wrote the book to try and impress that upon people, what the difference is. And when I paid for it, the, the lady at the tour said to me, can you tell me why you bought this book? So I told her. So she said, who's writing the forward? So I said, I actually don't know at this stage. She said, you've got to find the right person to write the forward for this book. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be working on that, don't worry. And then immediately afterwards, I met Andy at Isola's in um, Kildare Road. And I told him about this. So he just turned around and he says, why don't you ask Professor Janssen? And I said, why? So he said, your memory is quite bad. 
In 2003, you did a project at UCT for Stanford University, history professors and, and uh, master's students on apartheid. And so, yeah, I did. So I got home, sent him an email. Not even 10 minutes later, I got a response. With an absolute pleasure, please send me the manuscript. And the rest is history. So you'll read his, his take on it in the, in the, in the book. So yeah, um, and then three people who, who also wrote what the, the, I didn't know this word. My publisher, and I'll get to that in a sec, my publisher said to me, oh, we need some blurbs. So I, I don't know what a blurb is. What is a blurb? No, some people are going to read the book and then they're going to write something about it so that we can put it you know, in the book so people can see what they felt about it. So I luckily, well luckily, I was blessed to have taught at the International School in Hart Bay where I taught after I'd retired. Um, two authors. One is Swedish, and I've taught two of her four children, and the other one is, is English, and I taught her son. And I asked them to, to write. So Mari Summerly from Sweden, and she's written a lot of books, and I'm, I'm still annoyed with her because none of them have been translated into English yet. But she assures me she found, hasn't found the right person to translate them yet. They've tried, and it hasn't really worked. But she's assured me it's going to. But her books are actually about, uh, mostly about the peninsula and the Boerland. And that's why I really want to read them, but I can't read Spanish, no Swedish. <laughs> and then um, Wendy is, she's an, an author, um, she's an after dinner speaker. Um, she, she does a whole host of different things, and she's amazing, so she wrote a blurb for me. And then the third one, is sort of a little bit out of the blue because I asked a guy that I taught um, sort of when did I, when did he matriculate 2003 I think somewhere around there um, because for whatever reason he and I've got a, a very uh, sort of in a way spiritual connection he's an amazing guy he was at the, the previous launch unfortunately um, he and his wife Alexa live in uh, Bloemfontein, so they couldn't be here for this one because he's, he's quite an amazing um, human being. And Dedrick wrote the other one. Um, so I'm very, I'm very thankful to them. And then um, lastly, the publishers. The, the publishing a book, I was told, is, is, um, is difficult and long, and, and my brother-in-law Charles told me that and I didn't believe him. Well, Charles told me that like some in the first part of 2020, and the book only got published like recently. So yes, it takes long, and it is, it's just a long process. I was lucky enough to um, have names of particular people at um, Penguin Random House to contact directly, and the one said we publish sort of more um, like coffee table type at, at this particular unit in uh, Penguin, and the other guy said to me, "Yeah, we can look at it in 2024." And I said, "No, I want it like now." He said, "Well, I'm, I'll give you a name of a publisher," and they gave me the name of Shara Press in um, Midrand, and um, they did the the publishing for me, and I'm happy with the publishing. It, it just took too long for me. <laughs> um, I would have liked it to have happened quickly, but I was told it's going to take long. And a cousin of mine in the USA has published a number of books. He said to me, don't think you're going to publish this very quickly. So it does take, uh, it does take a while. So in a way, I'm a bit um, apprehensive of, of the next one. You know, in my mind, I think I'll publish it myself. But I don't know. It's a great idea. Though. But John will persuade me not to. I know. Maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, even you might have, picked it up. Even when I read the book, um, parts of it anyway, the, the, for me, I get very emotional. Um, and I, it's, it's weird because I've read so much of it so many times, and yet it doesn't, that doesn't go away. So I'm tremendously happy that I was able to write this book, that I was blessed enough to be able to, 
write this book and have it published. Well, well Jeff, thanks so much for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how can I possibly add anything to that? It, it's uh, it's quite incredible what you've put together, and uh, without further ado, I think let's call it a day. Congratulations on this amazing work, and I wish you every success with it. Okay. And uh, we've put a chain across the driveway, and you will be asked to present your copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, thank you very much for coming out, and safe travels home, and enjoy the book. Please eat some more that's... Well, eat some more sounds like biscuits. <laughs> eat more. <laughs> eat more. <laughs>